So. Yes. I'm going to go live again. Okay. I'm going to watch on my other screen over here and see. Make sure we're live. Make sure we're live. Make sure it's working. Otherwise, I'll just babble on to the, to the blank universe. You were perfect because I didn't even get a chance to give you my spiel about, you know, if someone, if one of us disappears, just keep talking, blah, blah, blah. But that is one of the wonderful benefits of talking to other performers. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, when I, I hosted a, a, a LGBTQ plus uh, show called Coronation, um, yeah. co-hosted with the organizer, Davey Swinton, and there were moments, and I knew this was going to happen because my internet is always a little strange here, but uh, but I knew there were going to be moments when I would freeze up, and I was Mr. Drag, yeah. so I'm just telling, rambling on, and then all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, I just froze up, all right, <laughs> so that I'd have to wait, and then I'd come back, and then I would say something funny and and like bring us back in, but um, but it was really funny. It's really funny. Oh, my I'm God. used to it. <laughs> I know, right? And it sounds even better in the Mr. Drag voice too, you know? It Any does. A lot of things do. We were doing, um, a friend of mine uh, got a rescue dog and she was trying to contact the woman to get the, uh, not a rescue dog, this woman was like a breeder or some, some, some such thing, right? And okay. she got this dog for free, French bulldog, and she had taken it to the vet and she needed to get the records. And after a while, the woman stopped calling her. So we were on a Zoom call a bunch of us and we started investigating it. And there were all these like horrible reviews of this woman. And oh so God. we started reading them in different people's voices. And I read one of them in Mr. Drag's voice. And it was like the perfect, like the words were perfect for his voice and like how I could stress some of the words in strange ways. And we were having so much fun doing it. I wonder if that woman ever saw it. Um, well, she wouldn't have seen us because we were just on a regular, you know, private Zoom call with our yeah. friends. Oh, right, right, right. But it was, yeah. it was, it was a fun thing to do. <laughs> he, and sometimes I do find that I find that I slip into his accent very easily. So, I'm sure, I'm sure, because it's probably like an extension of you at this point. How long have you been doing that character? Um, probably about three years now. But he really developed, um, like probably I would say two years ago is when he really started to develop and and started to come into play and now and we were Mr. Dragon Carl right um and I was doing it with Kat Adler and Carl was like the silent one you know he was mm -hmm. my associate my my companion okay. and he was the silent one and um and we were doing these shows so it was always this uh also this relationship between the two of us and and figuring that out and um we decided while we were in quarantine we decided that um you know, Kat wanted to take Carl to a different place. Mm -hmm. And that place wasn't, wouldn't work for the shows that we were doing. I mean, we're basically like, right. it's a very specific thing that we do and there's not much stretch to it, um, you know? And, and they wanted to explore things with Carl that just wouldn't have worked in a show. And we just thought it would be best, you know, to sort of do our separate things and you know Carl will still come with a holiday show like of course Carl will still be a part of it um but we just decided it was for the best because so now Kat can explore all these different things with Carl that you know that they've wanted to and and yeah, yeah. and so it's been interesting also this so since this time and doing quarantini um to be able to <laughs> figure out who he is now by himself without Carl without Carl, but now I have my sisters as well. So like we're creating this sort of big family of these people right. that come in and play different parts. Um, and, and you know, having Jane Williams and, and Michael Plunkett play my sisters is really good. And so oh, we're so working. Good. We're supposed to have a show in the fall, well in August, which obviously is not gonna happen, but so, but we decided to still do a show. So we're doing it like a TV show and we're gonna Oh my gosh. Posted on Egg Tooth and I think we're gonna figure out a way like people will get a link or whatever it is that you know you pay as if not as much obviously because it's not live, but you pay a little oh. bit to watch it to get the access to watch it. And so I've rewritten the entire script because I wrote it as a stage show and now we're gonna right. be doing it in my house. Um and as if we're all living here. 
and uh, and so all the dialogue had to change and and thinking about how how do we tell these stories because we wouldn't be like sitting around telling you know stories to each right. other that we've lived through. But you all know, right? Yeah. So it was kind of a reworking of that and then thinking about it in a more television perspective. And then when we do the musical numbers, we actually have a, a pianist who is working with us and um, we're gonna film those on the stage of the Shea. So it'll be like much more of like oh, a spectacle. Cool. And then when we're home, we're just gonna be a little bit more normal. <laughs> That's so exciting. That sounds so cool. Yeah. Oh my gosh. at the. So at the, at the risk of jinxing how smoothly this is going, I'm going to introduce you again. Yes. <laughs> so we're talking today on our Facebook Live series, so ask us to Joe Delude II, who is a Greenfield-based makeup artist, painter, performer, drag queen, um, teacher, presidential fellow at GCC. I don't even think I said that the first time. Okay. Um, and I'm super excited to be talking to you. I'm going to pair it myself. Um, because I feel like what we have to talk about today is just touching on everything that feels like is going on. So yeah. it's, it's June is Pride Month, both in Amherst and in many places globally. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, mm -hmm. that's happening and affecting all of us right now. For me, I'm really curious and going to ask a lot about your Mask Them series and how um, that has been impacted. And then also for the Mill District, as we have navigated COVID and trying to look at ways to really activate spaces that people can use and can be in, a mm -hmm. lot of focus has been on the outdoors and um, an uptick in public art. So you are going to be a part of that as well this year, which is really exciting. So I feel like we yep. have so many different things to talk about and then literally everything that comes out of your mouth brings up like another question like you, <laughs> you just mentioned the shea and so you know that brings up for me as a as a performer as well and as an artist living in the valley these questions about our theaters and our production companies and our freelance artists and our collectives and how we all navigate this time and find alternative ways to you know, highlight what's going on to offer space to bring in business, all of that. Yep. It just keeps going. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> With you. So I'm I'm really excited to to dive in. And if you don't mind, I do want to start with your Mask Fem series. Sure. Sure. I was super excited for you to see that you had finished because I know it was a huge series. How many paintings did it end up being? It's a really good question. It's 20 <laughs> 22, I want to say, or 20, somewhere around there. It was actually, it was going to be a lot more. Um, okay. And I had photos, I had about four or five more photos. And I was reaching a point where I realized that I needed to finish this. And and these photos oh. were amazing. And the, the, the drag queens and the drag kings that I was going to use were incredible. And I really, really, really wanted to do them. But I could feel that this was coming to an end and mm -hmm. I was having a harder heart and harder time to motivate myself to go into my studio and paint. And wow. I realized as much as I want to do this, I, I need to finish this. And coincidentally, the last two portraits that I decided to do were, uh, were two black queens. And mm -hmm. And which then motivated me because I was like these, you know, and I, my whole series is all diverse. You know, I, I have yeah. Caucasian, I have Asian, I have Latino, I have uh, a black. And sometimes I change skin color. Sometimes I made a skin color, a totally different color, like a yellow right. or a green or whatever. But, but I wanted a very diverse group of, of uh, people represented. And so it's just coincidence that I had, decided I was finishing this, got rid of all of the other photos that I had printed out and had these last two. And then all of this happened. And I was like, okay, oh, wow. I need to finish these. Like I need to make myself finish these. And, and, um, and it was hard. It was hard because yeah. I didn't feel like doing anything. Um, yeah. And, but I was like, this is important. And these faces need to be seen. Um, and especially this last one that I did, there was something about it. I was so into the painting of it 
that I, I, you know, and I, but I get into my paintings a lot, but this one, there was a lot of emotion that I was oh. feeling from the painting itself. Usually a lot of my emotion goes into the painting, yeah. which did happen, but I was getting, there was something about um, MX St. James, Amber St. James that, that I don't know, I, there was something that was really powerful and also said something for this being the last painting that mm -hmm. I did. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting. And it makes me curious. I'm not a visual artist. I'm not a painter. Um, and in for me in the world of theater, you know, it's it's pretty cut and dry when something is over. When the curtain yeah. comes in the last show, it's over. Um, so I'm curious about that feeling in your body and emotionally where you know something is done and or even if it's not done, you know you have to put it down. I mean, yeah. Is there, can you describe that? Yeah, it it feels like, um, it's like a feeling of, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, is what I, the best thing that I can relate it to. And it's not that I don't want to do it. It's just that I have spent what I have in me in this specific project. So, yeah. you know, it's like, it's, and you can equate it in doing theater, like if, you know, there are points in shows, if you're doing a, a show that's running unlimited, like mm -hmm. there's a point <laughs> where you realize like, I'm done with this. Like, I can't do this anymore. Like my body doesn't want to do this. I need to move on to something different. And I know yeah. that, you know, and one of the things is I'm creating a piece for the mill district. And I'm really excited about that piece. And I'm really excited about sort of changing it, figuring out how to do it. Because also I realized I can't, I can't paint a four foot by eight foot piece of wood in my apartment. I don't even know if I could get it in here. So I'm changing. I'm figure I'm that out. <laughs> I'm changing how I'm doing it. Um, but but I was really excited to start on just that one piece and really work on that one piece. And and I felt I couldn't work on that until I finished this. Yeah. Because it's a whole. It's similar in. Um, in feeling and in style and in genre, uh, but it's a it's much something much different, and it's a much mm -hmm. different expression of like Mask Femme is about the juxtaposition of masculinity and femininity and what we've been taught in our culture about what is beautiful, what is masculine, what is feminine, what does masculine mean, what does feminism mean, uh, right. feminist, you know, and and these social constructs that have been built up around these words. And I wanted to show these people who are both in, and in most ancient cultures, those were the people that were revered. Those were the ones yeah. that were commons, that were spiritual, that people went to for advice, that ruled communities um, right. because they could combine that masculinity and femininity into one. And that's ideally what you're always looking for. And I didn't feel complete until I embraced the feminine side of me that I had always like pushed away and was so afraid of and, and didn't want anybody to know about. And then when I embraced that feminine femininity in myself is when I finally felt like, oh, this is the person that, I, that I've been wanting to be this whole time. Yeah. Wow. And it was fear and it was fear that stopped yeah. me from, from being that. Right, right. Oh my God. I mean, that's such an unbelievably cathartic process. And it's been really interesting to watch that series as you've posted each finished one or in progress one, um, to watch that series evolve and see where it goes and, and the turns that it's taken. And it must be so remarkable to have started kind of before everything went into this unprecedented time of upheaval um, because you had started this painting series pre-COVID, pre no. no, no, I started it. I started it because I, everything shut down in my industry um, at the end of oh. February, at the end of February. So film, TV, okay. theater, everything shut down. So yeah. I was home and I was like, well, I have this time, I might as well you know, put it to good use and, and yeah, okay. Work on, you know, work and and it just started because I was like, eh, 
I'm gonna do a painting. And I had a picture of me from one of the Mr. Dragon Call show, the last Mr. Dragon Call show where I was had this big pink turban on. I loved that show. And um, and so I was like, that's a cool picture. Let me let me paint that. And I had a piece of wood that I had this dark painting that I had done when I was working on this one series that was involving my childhood and being brought up Catholic and the feelings mm. that revolve around that. And it was just this really dark painting of this sort of brother or priest with this belt that kind of looks like a snake in his hand. And then like his leg, like all these insect legs coming out from, from his cassock that he was wearing. And I just thought, looked at it and I was like, that's not who I am, mm. you know? And, and yeah. I painted over, gessoed over the whole thing and then did the painting of me and the turban on it. And I really liked it and I got really great response. And I just thought, this is what I need to do. And went and got some really 30 by 40 canvases. Um, and I just started looking up uh, bearded drag queens. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started. And I found these three that I started off with. And one of them was a cook a Caucasian man who I ended up making black because there was something about, he's a bald Caucasian man and um, he was screaming like with his head back. Yes. And, and I thought this, I need to change his skin color because the position, there's something about it that spoke to me as, and this is, you know, before all of, all of these things happened recently. And, but I was like, there's something about it. And I was afraid to do that because I was one afraid that the, the drag queen might take offense to that. Mm -hmm. um, and because I thank each one for the inspiration when I post it. And, yeah. and I, he loved it. He absolutely loved it. He was so excited. I ended up doing one of him because he was such an inspirational um, person. There's a couple of them that I've done uh, two of. And, um, and so that's how it started. And once I saw it, and I don't usually work in color. Mm -hmm. I'm always like, I've always done black, just white, unreal gray, when you gray, yeah. <laughs> And um, and I hope this is okay to say, but I, online, but I uh, uh, did a little ayahuasca uh, retreat. Yeah. And one of the things that I was shown during that were all these really bright psychedelic, and it's not a hallucinogen. So, right. so, but I, when I would close my eyes, I would see these really bright figures coming sort of at me, like just sort of flying past me really slowly, nothing like scary. And they were all super, super bright and colorful. And I started doing these paintings and I was like, oh, this is what it was showing me. It was showing me like, this is where you need to go. This is, this yeah. is where your heart needs to go. And I've always been, because I've always been dealing with things inside of me that I have now dealt with, Mm -hmm. All of my art, uh, everything I was doing was always very dark. Mm. And now that I've sort of dealt with those issues and, and approached those issues and, and still continue to deal with those issues, but they're not right. hiding them anymore. Now, things that I'm doing are much more colorful, much more mm. energetic, much more they have a, an element of fun to them as well. So, and, and it's, been, it's been great to have that. Yeah. What an amazing way to kind of mark your journey. Even just yep. this, the, the idea for me of you painting over that painting and that really being a moment of flipping into this new space that you're in is so beautiful. Yeah. And um, it started, it actually started when I went to set up Wicked in Mexico City, which I don't know, many years ago. Yeah. <laughs> many years ago. And, uh, and I went to Casa Azul, which is where Frida Kahlo lived mm -hmm. with Diego Rivera and toured mm -hmm. Casa Azul. And I remember walking into the kitchen and the colors being so bright and beautiful and these ceramics and the, the pottery and everything that was in there was so bright and beautiful. And that's when it started where I was like, I need to change because my, my places were always very similar, very mm -hmm. like neutral colors you know, clean surfaces, just wood and metal and, you know, everything neutral. And that's when I started like pulling more color into my home life. And yeah. so I just been like a natural progression. And that's so cool. I want to go there so badly. It's like my dream. I hold it up to myself. Casa's little, oh my gosh. 
yeah. And they've opened up a closet that never, that were, wasn't, yeah. So I haven't been there since they, op I, it was still closed. That closet was still closed. You want to go? I do. We'll go. I mean, I I'll love, go. and I have lots of friends in Mexico, Mexico City, and, um, and they're always like, come back, come back, come back. It's, yes. it's beautiful. Like it's beautiful. I just went there. I was in San Diego um, designing a, a show for La Jolla Playhouse. And um, a big designer, costume designer, and I took a trip down to wine country in Mexico, which I didn't even know Mexico had a wine country. I didn't either. And it was beautiful. It reminds you a little bit of Napa, oh. but just a little mm -hmm. bit more dirt roady. But like, <laughs> I mean, amazing. We stood at this amazing place. We went to the, all these different vineyards and they don't, they're, they make such small batches that they, um, that they uh, can't, it's too expensive for them because they have to pay such a huge um, yeah, on uh, distribution and yeah, export fee because of us having Napa and stuff. So, and they don't make enough to make it worth their while. But let me tell you, they were, uh -huh incredible wines. I was like, oh, why do we not get this? I and mean, why am I flying back? So I can't like bring, I bought, I bought two bottles. I bought a red and a white. And that was what I, cause I was like, I can fit those in my luggage. Right. But I wanted to get like cases of them, but you, you know, you, I couldn't. So, but yeah, wow. and, so it's, it's a beautiful country. It's beautiful people. The culture is incredible. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So, one thing that uh, you, you touched on and something that struck me also when uh, you did your live series a couple months ago of you painting in your studio um, was you talking about this, the gentleness that we have to show ourselves in these times that we haven't experienced before. So you were talking at the time um, again, I can't remember, it was like late March, early April, you know, all the COVID stuff had kind of just exploded around us. And you were talking about how hard it was for you to paint, just period, yeah. hard to paint, and the process of allowing that. And I think we are experiencing that uh, again right now when it comes to protesting, to the anti-racist work, educating ourselves, helping us understand all of this sort of ramp up around and stress around not going backwards. We're, we have to move forward. We have to make our statements. We have to be out there. We have to, you know, be in it as much as we can possibly be in it because this is the moment. That's kind of the feeling. And at least for me and, and in my life. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious how that has continued to evolve for you of being gentle with yourself, giving yourself the space to rest, recuperate, take a step back, dive in when you feel ready, all of, all of that. And sort of even looking at the bigger picture of it, I mean, you, you live in Greenfield, but your work, like many people in the Valley, takes you all over the place. Yeah. Um, especially in, in this kind of industry. So how have you continued to find ways to honor what you need? Mm. I think um, that's a huge question. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult. Um, yeah. It's not easy. Um, you know, last week um, I couldn't do anything. Um, and in response to, to what was happening in the country and thinking, wow, like people still think this way. People still think that black people are less than them because of skin color. And it, and it hit me really, really hard. And, you know, and I confront a lot of things myself. I mean, we were brought up, I'm, uh, how old am I? 48. Um, and, you know, I was brought up at a very specific time and my parents were welcoming to everybody, but yet my parents would say racist things and not being, not that they thought people, they wanted these people dead, but they would just say things because that's the way they were brought up. So that was ingrained within me. And I still mm -hmm. confront some of those things because it's sort of ingrained and it's ingrained in our culture. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
to see that this was happening and to think that we have moved past, or at least we're not moved past it, but moved further along to get this to a better place. And then to just see these events keep happening over and over and over again, and nothing mm -hmm. seems to change. And the people in power just don't do anything. And it hit me really, really hard to the point where on like the Monday of last week, I was in tears all day. And you know, I don't, as a gay man, yes, I felt discrimination, but I can walk down the street. I can jog down the street. I can go into a store and nobody's gonna take a second look. No one's gonna follow me around. Um, you know, maybe the tattoos, but um, but like I, I have this freedom. So even though I ha understand what discrimination is like, you know, I don't have that. I'm not thinking about it every day when I go walk out on the street and um. You know, whereas, uh, you know, a lot of my friends and some of my family, like they have to, they have to think about that. And, mm -hmm. and it just hit me so hard um, that I couldn't, I basically was on the couch watching TV for most of the week. And I kept going in and knowing that I had to do these paintings. And the, the next to last one had, was drawn and had the acrylic done on it. And I couldn't, mm -hmm. I was sitting on my easel and I, Every time I tried to go in there to do it, I couldn't do it because I, I realized what I was feeling was going to come out in this painting. And I wanted mm -hmm. this painting to be about joy and beauty. And if I painted it the way that I was feeling at that moment, it wouldn't be the same. And I don't, it would come across as my reaction. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be false in displaying who this person was because I don't know what their experience is like and I don't want to put my uh, sadness into someone else right. as a portrayal of what the experience was like and so I knew that I had to wait and that's where you have to be okay with those things mm -hmm. you, know, you have to be sit there and be like you know what I am feeling bad and I am having to confront a lot of my own internal racism and mm -hmm. and I have to be okay with that and I have to confront those feelings um, right. you know and I have to listen is 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 my is the biggest thing like I have to listen to what people are saying I can't I'm not a, a pro, like it's not it's never been part of me to go out and protest um, mm -hmm. I think into like one anti-war protest back in the day when when Bush was still president in New York. Yeah. Um, I think that's the only time I've ever been to a protest. It there's some I I don't know what it is, but it's just not mm -hmm. who I am. Yeah. Um, and so my big thing was learning like to listen, to listen to what these people are saying, to listen to these poets. Um, I found this amazing. Uh, uh, Wan poetry, uh, W A N poetry on Instagram, um, that like listening to these poets talk about their experiences is so powerful. And and you know my job is to support and to listen, um, mm -hmm. and help out when I can. But it's not my job to be their voice. And I think yeah. that a lot of people are not understanding is that as a as a white person who doesn't understand the experience and never had to go through it yeah. you, can't, you can't be their voice you are their support you are there to help right. and, and, and so being generous with yourself and being kind to yourself is listening to that voice in yourself that says you know I can't do anything. Like there were people going, I don't understand why people like this person's like working out 24 hours a day and doing, going on jogs every day and like painting paintings and, you know, writing and doing all this stuff. And it's like, and I don't feel like doing, all I'm doing is eating and watching Netflix. And, well, then that's what you need. That's right. what your body needs. There comes a point where you're going to feel, all right, I need to get up off this couch and I need to do something. And you may yeah. have to force yourself to do something. Mm -hmm. But you also have to listen to what you're telling yourself um, right. and, and pay attention to that and just be okay. With it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's all, that's all so important. And I, I have a question kind of related to that and I'm gonna stumble through it because I'm not sure exactly how to word it. 
Um, but one thing that has come up for me lately, because June is Pride Month in Amherst. Um, and so in the Mill District, before COVID, um, I had had all of this programming planned uh, to celebrate Pride Month, right? And, you know, everything from, you know, drag brunches to parades, outdoor movies, um, definitely still public art, but um, then having to pull back and figure out ways to still celebrate this month, celebrate Pride, um, replace some of the experiences that people were really missing, you know, huge Pride gatherings and parades from Holyoke to New York, just, you know, so many plans that friends of mine had. Um, so trying to, or feeling, I guess, a little responsible to fill that gap. Um, and then on top of that, having everything get ramped up again around justice for Black people in this country and really, really rooting out and looking at the foundational systemic issues, mm -hmm. you know, getting to that, that real enough is enough point. One thing that has come up uh, just in the last week, I think, uh, for me as a placemaker is that I still had things that works for Pride Month, um, virtual Pride Month, mm -hmm. around dancing and celebrating and, you know, coming together and talking about being queer, about being gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans, whatever it is, you know, having spaces to celebrate. And having some people who were in the mix um, in those celebratory plans say, is it okay to celebrate right now? Can we, you know, can we continue pride in the face of, you know, a lot of us in the queer community have experienced oppression, have experienced violence at the hands of police. We are in this as allies in a way that makes it feel like anything celebratory is out of line. And I'm curious what your feeling is um, as someone in that community when you're looking at your allyship, but then you're also looking at your own history and I'm making assumptions about your history because I don't know you know, if you've had firsthand experiences with the police, I have um, in Ohio. Um, One of my least favorite states. Sorry, Ohio. <laughs> Sorry. So many bad things have happened in Ohio. So many bad things. So many good things. So many bad things. I mean, some good things have happened in Ohio, but so many bad things yes. have happened for me, like a person. Yes, me so. too. Me too. Um, and so I'm just curious, kind of, where for you personally, um, the line is around celebrating progress in your community as a gay person, queer person, and also recognizing that not only is that oppression not over in our community, it is beyond far from over for Black people. That's why we're in this moment. So is there a way to reconcile those things? Should should the celebration of Pride Month pause, ease off? Um, you know, I don't, I don't think it's wrong to celebrate. I think it's wrong to celebrate in the way that we normally celebrate. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think we can still take pride in what has happened. But, you know, pride started out of a revolution, out of... Yeah a protest out of a riot. And then it became a corporate sponsored party. Mm -hmm. And I think that as an LGBTQ plus community, we need to understand our history one, which a lot of people, and especially a lot of the younger generation don't know the history. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really important to know your history um, and to understand why we have this now and why you can go out and do drugs and party and, and dance on top of a flatbed truck in a, right. a giant parade. Right. Um, and so, so I don't think it's wrong to celebrate pride. I think it's wrong to celebrate pride in the way that we have been right now. 
Um, yeah. I miss, I said, I said to, to my best friend, Ange, uh, who you know, I said to her the other day, I was like, you know what I'm really want to do when all of, not the Black Lives Matter is over, but when the quarantine and the COVID mm -hmm. settles down, I was like, I need to dance. Yes. Because I miss, I mean, I dance in my house all the time now, but I miss being out and listening to music and, and dancing yes. around people. And we all need a release. So, you know, having a bit of a release is okay, but mm -hmm. you can't let that distract from the work right. that you've done. And that's what ends up happening in our country a lot of times is that yes. protest, 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 yell, 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 yell. And then, okay, it's been a month, all right, I'm gonna go back to normal and then nothing. Yes. And so right. we need to keep that focus um, to make sure that things do change this time. You know, part yeah. of that is going out voting, voting these old white people out so that a younger generation who has incredible ideas. Um, yeah. I don't know if you saw the town hall with Barack Obama and, um, um, oh God, I'm gonna blank out on everybody's names. Every time I try to talk about something with people's names, I forget. But um, there was a councilman uh, from Minneapolis who was on it, um, Philippe. Cunningham, I believe is his name. Mm -hmm. And he is a black trans man. And he, the ideas that he was coming up with about how a community can keep itself safe. You know, these are the people that we need to be in power because we need that, we need these ideas. We cannot continue to function. And same thing with pride. Like we cannot continue to have this corporate sponsored party yeah. Ending like that is what we're proud of. Like yeah. we are proud because yes, we can express ourselves. We can get dressed up or we can take off most of our clothes if we want to. You know, we we can we have this expression and we feel we have the space to do it in. But mm -hmm. I think we need to un merge back into what it originally was. And because even in the oh. LGBTQ plus community, like it's really about white gay men. And that's pretty much what it is. And that's how it's been the whole time. Like, mm. you know, people of color don't always have a place when, when people are fighting for LGBTQ plus rights, they're not considering people of LGBTQ plus people of color. They're not right. considering trans people. You know, a lot of times if, if they're white males, they're not considering lesbians. Um, mm -hmm. you know, if they're lesbians, they're not considering men. Um, we have a lot of adversity in our own, like, you know, between like different things, like the bears and the twinks and the this and the that. Like I, I talking to my, my best friend, James, we, we had started a podcast and, and he was talking about, we were talking about our time in Atlanta, which was like 1993 or something. And how, you know, he's always been bigger and he's, he's been tatted and he, you know, I don't think he had much facial hair at the time, but he was like, yeah, that wasn't a thing back then. Like he, you know, people weren't attracted to him. He's like, now everybody's attracted to big bearded beers, bears right. because that's the cool thing now. But back then, <laughs> it wasn't. And, and it's interesting to see that and you still see yeah. it, you know? So it's okay. Like I am proud of, of you know, being a gay man. I, I bought a flag. I had a regular rainbow flag and I went, and I ordered one of the new flags that has the rainbow on it, but then on the edge has a triangle that has the black, the brown, the like pink and the like light blue to represent everybody. And it's that thing of change. Like when they yeah. first wanted to include the black and the brown stripes onto the, the rainbow flag, people were in such an upheaval about it. And they're like, no, yeah. it's like, but we need to change. Obviously yeah. we need change and yeah. you by not by having such a strong feeling against adding two colors to that you know yeah. says it, that says it all you know yeah. you People are being weird in that moment yeah and i think you know i i think a big dance party would is fun and i think it's great and and you know it can help you release a lot of the stress but i don't yeah. think that that's the focus of what we should be doing right now. We should be yeah. celebrating who we are and also 
helping to figure out how to make this country and this world better. Yeah, yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. I think that's such, that's a great way to kind of put it all in perspective um, and talking about all the different viewpoints and the evolution and the willingness to change that touches all of our communities and all of our movements. And I see people watching, which is so exciting. So uh, hello to Yusef and Lori and Trenda. Hi, Trenda. Hi, Trenda. Curtis and Trenda uh, put a comment on there elaborating on uh, your mention of the Stonewall riots and how that uh, particular riot was started by Black, uh, black trans women. Black yeah. trans women. Yep. Um, and which is another thing that sort of gets thrown under the carpet. Too. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That they made that movie and didn't include them in it. And it was like white men. And so, but that they weren't the ones. Right. Right. You know? Absolutely. Um, then we have another comment from Curtis McKemmy. I think it's a joke, but I'm not positive because I don't know Curtis. Um, but I think it's a tongue in cheek comment about, you know, was, isn't COVID over after the protests? <laughs> like, haven't we moved on? Um, I think we all feel that way sometimes and um, yeah. are, are all, I mean, I, I can't, almost can't count the number of, you know, emails and texts and calls that I've been involved in in the past week about, you know, do we protest, do we not? I thought COVID was the most important thing, but this feels much more important, um, you know, and it's, what it brought up for me is, is that this is going to get dark. I'm sorry, everyone out there, but I, I have been marketing this series as an, a series of honesty. Um, what it's brought up for me, these questions of, of protesting or not, or how we get involved, um, is that there has been a, a lot of risk and death. Hope is very real. Brutality from police leading to death is very real. You know, yeah. all have to, to navigate, just as you're saying, we have to find out what feels like our way and really just get behind that 100%. I think that has been the most important thing and um, I've appreciated in my own circle seeing people encourage that in one another, you know, yeah. to feel into it, take a moment, find out what feels right and true to you and then do it and do it 100%. Yeah, so, and I think, you know, I've talked to my friends that have been going to the protests in, mm -hmm. in big cities, not like around here. Yeah. And you know, they felt very safe um, as yeah. far as like COVID. I've heard the same. Concern. You know, mostly everyone is wearing masks. Um, you know, yes, but and they're also outside, which I feel is a right. lot better than being stuck inside. Definitely. Uh, and, you know, so, and I think it's important. And that's the kind of thing where you have to decide, like, you know, what is important? Are you willing to, are you willing to put yourself out there and put yourself out in the danger of that to move things forward? Right. And that is your choice. So, but yeah. I mean, and you, but you see people still at the supermarket. Well, now they have to wear a mask, but I remember in the, <laughs> towards the beginning, like before the supermarket said, you, you have to wear a mask to come in, seeing like, all these people in their like 70s and 80s, just their carts, no masks, no gloves, nothing, yeah. and not keeping their social distancing and being so pissed, mad um, that they had to, like all of these things were happening and they had to go down an aisle the one way and then they had to do like right. they had to this line so far apart from each other. And I was like, but so you'd rather die because you're at a higher risk. And it's just, it fascinates me, the, the mentality of people that like, you know, use this time for your, to your advantage. Yes, I wanna uh, go back to work. I can't yeah. tell you how yeah. much I wanna go back to work and I don't even really enjoy it all the time, but I, wanna, <laughs> I want to be able to go back out there. I want to be able to go out and hang out with my friends. Yeah. But I have, I understand we are in a different time. And the thing is, okay. we, are so complacent because we have gotten used to how things were going. We have never had to deal with, you know, anything really super major. We had 9-11, which was really big. And 
you know, and, but it was the same thing. It was yeah. everybody coming together for a brief moment and then everything went right back to normal. Yes. Um, we can't go yeah. back to normal after this. No. No. After any of this, it wasn't normal. Yeah, we can't go back to what we were, and so we need to learn to evolve. And I, I work on that every day. It's funny that he's Trenda is watching, because uh, I, I, I love I, it. I've been trying to get Trenda in the Mr. Drag family. <gasps> yes. And trying to figure it out. Well, so we had a, uh, uh, so when we were doing one of the shows we were losing the person who was normally played a sort of our, who, we had one person playing the maid and one person playing a, like the chef. And they were, one wasn't gonna be in the show and then the other one was playing a different character. So I had asked Trenda to come in and without even thinking said, will you come in as like, you know, our new butler maid type of person, not even thinking. And this is where I'm saying like, mm -hmm. I have a lot of work to do because in my head, mm -hmm. it was a character and I could right. like, up and make funny and we could do some really fun cool things and then Trenda said well no because I don't I don't take roles that do that and and it was like like my mind explodes like oh my god I didn't even think of that and that is my white privilege and it was something that made me very uncomfortable and I had to, mm. to address it and and I said that I wanted to talk to her more about it and we never got a chance to really talk or make our schedules and you know life gets really busy but like yeah. I enjoy that and and some of my other friends my good friend Lasonia who's a makeup artist who has to deal as black, a woman of color black woman beautiful and has to deal with all of these things when she goes into spaces and we her and I have had some of the toughest conversations and and it has been one of the best things and yet we continue to grow from these conversations um because she knows that I am willing to do the work and I am willing be uncomfortable and get into these situations and it's not going to affect our relationship if anything it makes it stronger and i think that if we all did that if we all weren't afraid of being called out on our shit, then yeah. you know it doesn't feel good you know i tell Ange all the time i was like you tell me exactly how you feel whether you think i'm gonna like it or not yeah. because maybe i won't maybe i will maybe i'll get angry mm -hmm. you know what i'm gonna think about what you said and take that in and figure out, okay, wow. how do I, how do I move on? How do I become a better person from this? And it's been great. It's uncomfortable and it hurts sometimes, but it's, it's great. And, yeah. and that's, that's what we need to do. So. Yeah. I could not agree more. I couldn't yeah. agree more. And I think I'm hoping, you know, maybe it's the optimist in me that one of the things that will come out of this whole period of time where things are just happening back to back in very intense ways um, is that we'll all, but especially white people, um, we'll get a little bit more comfortable with our discomfort and with our shame and with the things that we didn't point out. I, I was listening to Brene Brown's podcast the other day, because I love her. Um, and she had on uh, Ibram X. Kendi, who's a, a professor and writer and speaker um, uh, and I'll link to it on this show, but um, I really appreciated the way that he talked about the anti-racism work that white people, all people, but white people especially, were being called to do, and the kind of fine line for many of us who feel like we have already been doing that work, have already been showing up to it, have already been facing those things, um, but that the call to us was to continue to do it so that, you know, in, while we're focused on bringing other white people into the spaces that we feel we know and understand, when we find something in ourselves, making that just as important, facing that, looking at it, talking about it, admitting it, whatever the process of opening, uncovering, cleaning out, and really looking at is, um, that that's the real part of anti-racist work. And I think the way that he put it, and I'm paraphrasing is, you know, anti-racist work is looking for that systemic racism and addressing it wherever you find it. And that can be. Yep. In and it, it works for, I mean, every, 
aspect of life, like as part of my fellowship for GCC, mm-hmm. which badly got shut down, um, <laughs> I was going to be doing this identity workshop. Um, right. And and so it's two parts, and I won't reveal everything about it because there's secret parts of it. So hopefully one day we'll get back to it. But yeah. uh, but the first we were able to do the first day of it. Um, it's because there's a week in between each section, mm-hmm. and. So we do all these, we're doing all these exercises and identity. I'm talking about my own experiences, asking them about theirs. They fill out these like little worksheets that, and there are these different things, like things that are unchangeable about your identity, like where you were born, um, you know, how old you are, you know, blah, blah. And so I was saying like, these are fixed ones. And then of course, like part of your identity, like, you know, your favorite type of music, those things can change over time. But one of the things that I said, you know, was saying that you can't change that was on this thing was the amount of siblings you have. And then it just dawned on me. I was like, well, that's not true. But I, like, I just jokingly just sort of said, well, unless you find out you have more siblings from somewhere else that you didn't know about. And just sort of, you know, just said it like that. Well, yeah. this one woman came up to me during a break and she said, I just wanted to let you know, um, you know, when you said that, it completely turned me off because that's what happened to me because I found out that my dad had had a child with another woman. I think that's what the case was. And yeah. and she she was like, and, and it really affected me because he, you know, never told us about it and lied about it. Mm. And... And she's like, so it, I started to shut down after I heard that. And she said, and I have to bring myself back in and, and, and I'm back in and she's like, and I'm not, she's like, I'm not angry. She's like, I just wanted you to be aware of that. And it like, that was another thing, like the situation with Trenda where I was like, oh my God, like I didn't think of that because it, to me, it was just a comment that I said, but right. like, I had to then like deal with that uncomfortableness and you know, and I apologized to her and she's like, you don't have to apologize. And I was like, no, I do. Like, I do have to yeah. apologize to because I didn't even think about that. And this mm-hmm. is something I need to start thinking about this. Like, I always make this joke about how here in Western Mass, we're in this weird liberal bubble where everybody is uber politically correct. Like, you can't say anything because someone will call you out on everything mm-hmm. that you say. And you're like, these are corn muffins. They'll be like, no, they're not. They're maize because that is the, that's what the traditional people called it. And you know, and I always make fun of like those things, but they are things that we really need to think about, you know, yeah. and there are things in all aspects of life, you know, right. that we're going through. Um, and yes, you people can be overly sensitive and, and there is a mm-hmm. point where you like, you know who the people are and, you know, you sort of gauge, but, but I think you, we really need to be more aware of yeah people around us and and this is a different world than what we used to be in even you yeah. know years ago yeah yeah absolutely and I mean, 10 years ago we would never be doing this right right absolutely and such props to the woman who came up to you because you know we're sitting here talking about how we show up for one another for the people that we know but showing up to this work with people we don't know yeah. especially people who are you know in our world in they're our teacher or they're our boss or there are um you know a position where we might be hesitant to to call them out or call them in um so awesome that she took a minute to come up to you and i i appreciate journey and for her journey yeah and i really appreciated it i mean and it made me feel like crap like i felt i was so yeah. I, it took me a minute to get out of that because right. i i imagine myself and I want to be this all-inclusive person, this person that, you know, is here for everybody. And, you know, realizing that, yes, that is majority of of who I am, but then Mm -hmm. there is still stuff that I need to deal with and and stuff that I need to learn um, in myself, no matter how open and inclusive I I am, there's still more to learn. Right. That's that's with all, you know, that's with all yeah. of us. Yeah. But yeah, um, very sad that I never got to do the second half of that. Um, yeah. That, yeah, we're trying yeah. to figure out, we're trying to figure out with GCC now, like how to 
move this forward a little bit um, because mm -hmm. we're also going to make a documentary about it because um, Harry Karamidis was is the other um, presidential fellow, artist fellow, mm -hmm. and he's a film editor. And so we, oh, were, very cool. we were going to film all of these workshops and we we're going to do multiple ones that involved mm -hmm. people from the school, people from the community, anybody that wanted to do it. And then we were going to create a documentary that we would then show, um, you know, and, and so sadly we can't do that right now, but we're trying, we're right. trying to figure out ways to continue to do things. Right. Right. We oh, presidential we'll fellow. Get back to it. I would love to see that work. Yeah, it was it was really going to be really interesting too. The second part is really interesting, um, and it would have been fun to see how this changed some of the people that were in it. But um, yeah, but yeah. So hopefully one day we will get there. But, um, but yeah, for now we'll just yeah. have other things to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to use this opportunity to say to everyone watching, if anyone has a question, please put it up there because I'm not going to take too much more of Joe's time. Um, but the while I'm waiting to see if anyone has questions, uh, the last question I wanted to ask you um, was about public art in the Mill District, which of yeah. course is top of mind for me all the time. Um, and I know that at kind of at the beginning of things, we had talked about certain designs and um, ideas for it. And I'm wondering um, if, if the content has changed at all for you, if you're feeling yourself wanting to include other pieces in it. Um, and I don't wanna give everything away and also it's still in the ideation phase, but you know, there were threads of uh, the history of Coles, and there are threads of that Masked Femme series that first inspired conversations between you and Cinda, and there were threads of, um, you know, just work and different things that had happened in North Amherst. Are there other pieces that you now think you want to kind of bring in, or other themes or feelings that are important to you when you think about public art, not just in the Mill District, but public art in general? For my public art, um... I mean, I can include, I can include some of those things anyway, but I don't want to, I don't feel if for me as a, as a white gay man artist that I can approach things that are not part of who I am. Yes. I can't speak about someone else's struggles and put it in my art. I can make my art diverse, which was going to happen anyway. So that yeah. that art was going to be very di with a diverse group of people. Right. Um, so that hasn't changed at all. And I feel like if I start, you know, it, it, I had to reconcile that with, you know, doing these last two paintings that were that were black men, mm -hmm. and um, or black people, I should say, um, and uh, and. I had to think about that. Like I had to take a step back and be like, oh my God, like I don't want anybody to think that I'm jumping on the bandwagon right. because of right. what's happening. They were always part of this series. Um, and so, and then I had to realize, no, they are part of my community. They are part of my LGBTQ community and I can okay. speak from that experience. And this whole thing is about having a diverse group of people who are masculine and feminine and showing that there is beauty in that. And so then I realized, okay, this is okay. But if I had like, to, if I suddenly decide to be like, I'm gonna do a whole series of black women, like, right. I mean, what is that? A white man doing a whole series about black women? Like, eh. right. you know, like what does that yeah. say? That says white privilege right there, that you mm -hmm. feel like you can create right. a that addresses this issue when I've never had to confront that issue. Yeah, yeah. You know, no, so I can speak from LGBTQ, which is what more of what this piece is about. Mm -hmm. um, their position in the world, um, but but it it was always planning on being diverse. So, um, so yeah. Yeah, I'm so excited. I'm excited to talk more offline about it. I um, know, I know. I have I right? have ideas and that I have to run by you because I think that these are gonna be. It's gonna be a really cool piece of public art. 
Awesome. Oh, I'm so excited. Um, and thank you, Trenda, for asking a question. Yes, Trenda. <laughs> Trenda, it's amazing that you're watching because you're so a part of this conversation. It really feels sad. And also, Trenda, I do have a character for you for the holiday show, hopefully that you can do and to be part of the drag family. And I, I'm really excited. So I'll talk to you about that later. Oh my God, I'm so excited. I'm going to come. Uh, so Trenda asked, um, when it comes to place making and art making, um, what strategies might be helpful in connecting across class and racial difference, especially as long-term commitment to change? Mm -hmm. And I can read um, that again if that. Helpful. No, I, I I get that. Um, you know, in in my makeup work, um, mm -hmm. I whenever I have needed to build a team of people, I do want the best artists with me. But I also want a diverse group of people. You know, I want men, I want women. I want some LGBTQ people in there. I want different people of color. Um, you know, because it is important as an artist and, and to make sure that everyone feels like they're represented. So when I did Jesus Christ Superstar, I had a team of uh, 15 makeup artists. And oh. There were people that I, I definitely wanted on my team, but they were already had started to be diverse. But when I was talking to my department head, when she was looking for other people, I said, we need to have everybody represented in here. Mm -hmm. This group of people, these performers are all diverse. Mm -hmm. And we need them to walk into this room and not see a bunch of white people. And you know, because it was, there were, there were black people, Latino, Asian. Um, I was like, they can't come into this room and see a bunch of white people in the room and so i think when you're when you're creating art or when you're going to make it you need to think about diversity in your art mm -hmm. so you know if you're illustrating a children's book um and Ange and i have this conversation a bunch like it's not about making a statement it mm -hmm. is about just putting someone in there and and kids have said that about i think i can't remember what she said but one kid had said something about can you write a story, just a normal story with, with like a black kid in it? Like, it's not about trying to get this message out sometimes, it's about right. just having it visually be there so that yeah. you start seeing these visuals. Because if you look like our ads, things like that, like back in the day, no people of color were in them. And, mm -hmm. you know, and so, you were not used to seeing that. You weren't used to seeing people of color on television. And sometimes it's not right. about creating a specific situation that addresses an issue. It's about putting it out there and just having this piece out there so that you see different people and you're not always seeing the same type of, of, of person. Right. Um, you know, and I think that's important. Yeah. I think people need to see themselves in pieces and it's not always about statement pieces that are trying to make a point right. in a way, but about, yeah, just let's, let's start being more inclusive in, in just in general. Yeah. You know, does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. No, I think it, it makes so much sense. And did that answer your question, Trenda? Sorry, Trenda. Trenda, did, did Joe answer your question? I hope. I'll give a minute to put that, but um, I think I just want to drive that point home that you're making about, I'm like pointing with my pen, I'm like really into this conversation. Um, I wanna drive that point home because I think that that is such a crucial thing where we're talking about art or we're talking about politics or we're talking about education and we're talking about representation. And one thing that I have really appreciated seeing in a lot of the sort of suggestion literature of how to help um, you know, different resources, books, things like that. One thing that I've seen a lot is the encouragement of including, you know, books, games, toys, things like that, um, that are representing uh, people of color, especially children of color, not only in communities where there is racial diversity already, but also and especially in communities that are mostly white. And yeah. we, I think we 
think sometimes that representation means if there are people of color, there should be people of color reflected in things when actually, you know, and the Valley is a great example of this where, it, where we have a lot of spaces that are predominantly white. Um, and I think some people get into a mindset where they're like, well, you know, I don't have to represent this as, as much, but the truth is that it's just as important for white children and white people to have that diversity in their mind from the beginning. Yep. So as life continues and you're in more spaces and you're, you know, experiencing life in a larger and larger spectrum as you get older, your foundational understanding is rich because mm -hmm foundation and the systemic issues right now are the ones that are really needing to be undone. And so right from the start, representing things is just so well, I, can't, I can't even tell you like how as, as a gay man, like how much I enjoy seeing something where there's an LGBTQ plus character who isn't the plucky funny sidekick, who, uh -huh. isn't, who isn't the serial killer um, you know, yeah. like just, just a character, you know, just yeah. having a character where they don't have to be this, this specific, you know, right. stereotype that we've seen the whole time because that's what people think works. Yeah. You know, like screw what people think works. Like we're having this whole discussion now in theater with the, you know, and on Broadway where, um, you know, the, the actors and performers of color especially black performers of color are now calling out mm -hmm. theater and, yeah. and about, and with um, uh, 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 W-A-T, it's, um, what, uh, I'm playing it, it's American theater. Uh, why am I forgetting these things? Um, but it was this really amazing letter that they wrote and all of these people signed, all performers of color, black, Asian, Latino, um, mm -hmm. and it is, it's like people will only do certain things because they're like, well, the audience, this is the audience, the, but like, yeah, this is your white audience, but right. what about, what about diversifying and creating a broader audience? What about yes. being, instead of doing a revival or doing a jukebox musical or doing a musical based on a movie, which I shouldn't say because Beetlejuice was... No, don't bite the hand, Joe. <laughs> but I mean, at least that was a new musical. But like, right. you know, yes, yes. and it was good and it was well done. Like, yes. you know, I think that that's the issue that we're having is that there's so much good work out there from uh, you know, artists of color, from LGBTQ plus, from women, like there are all these amazing, amazing pieces of work. And yeah. our industry is again, still led by a bunch of old white men, whether they're gay old white men or straight old white men, they're still white right. old white men. And yeah. that's all they cater to. And I have seen mm -hmm. shows that had so much potential be destroyed because of what the person in charge did. And I'm not going to say one particular musical, but yep. it was basically an old white man trying to tell the story of a black woman. How can you tell the story of a black woman? You are not a black woman. Right. It's not like she's just a character that's there. It is focused on her. Right. And how can you do that? And I think, you know, creating more diverse groups of designers to come in, mm -hmm. you know, creating shows where it doesn't matter. You're not doing a revival of a 1940s musical where everyone would have been white, you know? Right. Like, and you have your token black person, usually your token black man, your token black woman, mm -hmm. um, maybe your token Asian woman. Um, right. You know, like seeing a show like Allegiance that I worked on, like, like seeing, you know, pretty much a, m almost all Asian cast, except for mm -hmm. the few white people that were needed to be in it to tell the story, which told the story about the Japanese and the internment camps during World War II here in this country. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, and it was amazing. And, you know, to see such a diverse group of, of creators in this and people who had that experience 
or had learned that experience from their parents or their grandparents about what it was like and being able to tell this story. Um, you know, I think was it was really amazing and really powerful to see something like that. And sadly, an incredible musical like that about a part of our history that we never learn about, that we never oh. taught in history class, mm -hmm. um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, people don't respond to it. And because Broadway is so expensive, the people that yes. maybe might respond to it or could respond to it can't afford to go to it. I don't even go to Broadway shows because I don't want to pay 150 to $200 for a ticket to go see right. something. Like that's right. That's expensive. I know that it costs a lot to put these productions up, mm -hmm. but there are ways right. where you figure out what you can do to make this into something better, make this this space into something better. And that's another that's another conversation we need to have as artists is yeah. how to make our spaces into some place where everybody is included and where everyone feels welcome. Um, years ago, I had wanted to start when I was touring, I had wanted to start this program, but being on tour, it was it, and moving constantly, it was hard to do this and hard to figure out. And I'm, I don't have a business mind sense, but I wanted to do to create an organization so that kids from and, and adults from low income families could come and see Broadway shows when they were touring mm -hmm. for free. Yeah. Figuring out how to set that up and how to get the money so that it can pay for the tickets. And if there's a way that like organizations then would, you know, do like a, a cheaper group rate because of it, mm -hmm. but expose, expose these kids that wouldn't be exposed to this. When I was young, my family, my parents were not artists. They were working class people. They didn't go to museums. They didn't do any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. My godmother did. And my godmother took me to museums and took me to art galleries and exposed me to music and art. And it changed who I was because I had this side of me and she recognized it and she fostered that. And if mm -hmm. we could do that with, with people who don't have the means to, or access to these things, imagine what could happen and imagine what, yeah. where those kids then could bring us. Yes. Uh. Yeah, God, I could not agree more and think you should start that organization. And Trenda said that you, uh, that it's a good start for answering the question and she'd love to talk and strategize more about this. I have a feeling a lot of strategizing is going to come out of this particular thing, uh, which would be great. Um, and she said thinking on representation and inclusion and pushing ourselves further, which yeah. I think a lot of us are, are feeling. Um, and in that also keeping the doors open to, to bring people in who um, are just beginning to do a lot of this work and face a lot of this in themselves. Mm -hmm. And Trenda also mentions that the difference between the presence of and meaningful engagement of folks um, of a variety of identities and how things are for people that are included in pre-existing systems uh, she says, probably a conversation, not for this program. Totally. <laughs> we can have that conversation. We can um, have that conversation. We can I would have that conversation. Absolutely. And I definitely, um, I'm smiling because I get excited when there are conversations that need to be had because as a placemaker, um, sometimes the easiest part of my job um, is creating spaces and places where these conversations can happen. Yeah. Um, and so I'm excited to, to look more deeply at how the Mill District can foster those spaces um, and continue to connect uh, with people like you, like Trenda, leaders and artists throughout the Valley who want to facilitate these conversations, want to encourage them, want to hold space for them. Um, I'm really interested in just having more and more spaces where we can be really honest and feel really safe yeah. um, and just Keep digging, keep digging, yeah. I think. I agree, I agree. Like, cause there's so much more that I need to learn as well. Yeah. And, and, you know, like the conversations are important for me because I want to learn more and I want to be able to be more effective, you know, in, in what I believe in, yeah. but no right now or don't understand yet. 
And I right. think it's important to, to understand what your limitations are, you know? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Well, Joe, you have been so unbelievably generous with your time, with your internal process and experience. Is there anything else you want to share or put out there before I let you release you to the rest of, of your day? <laughs> Which I don't know what it consists of right now, but um, uh, no, I mean, I, I think we pretty much covered everything. I mean, if we can't do the holiday show in person, if we can't have people at the Shea, mm -hmm. um, we are going to film it and film it like you're watching a holiday TV special. So, um, and hopefully all of the performers will be okay with that um, because we, we think it's important to continue to do art. And as a board member of, of Productions, you know, one of the conversations we had was about creating a season, um, you know, where even though we know a lot of this is virtual, people still need to be exposed to art in some form or another. And we're trying to, to figure out how that is and how we can do that. And so, you know, we're still trying to, to create things like John Bechtold is doing a class this weekend. Um, I'm doing yes. a camp for, LG, hopefully, for LGBTQ plus kids in August um, about identity. And um, so, you know, I, I, I hope that we continue to do this and I hope that we continue that we can figure out how to continue to bring more diversity into this area because I think this yeah. is an incredible area, it's an incredible space, yeah. fosters artists so well. So now how can we bring different voices in here? Mm. Yeah, yep, 100%. Well, Joe, thank you so, so, so much for being honest and open to this conversation. It really has been awesome and my brain is going in a million places. You're probably gonna get a lot of emails from me. Um, and uh, for everybody watching, Joe is going to be back on our Facebook on Friday the 12th at 5 p.m. to do a makeup tutorial, um, which is going to be so much fun. And I highly recommend everybody tune in. And um, I, can I tell them what it is? Yes. I did just come up with this idea while I was sitting in the dentist chair um, today. So originally, <laughs> Thanks, dentist. Was, originally our idea was that I was going to do Mr. Drag makeup and then turn right. into Mr. Drag and we would do a little interview. But as you see, I don't have a beard because I, I needed to shave it off for some things and I need to keep it off for um, a couple of things that I have coming up because um, I'm working on a short film um, mm -hmm. and, that I wrote and uh, I need to not have a beard for it. So. Um, mm -hmm. But I came up with this idea. So we're gonna do still do a drag makeup, yeah. but uh, I am gonna take suggestions from you or whoever is watching about creating this drag character on the spot. So oh my God. we'll go into more detail about what it's actually like, what, what the process will be. Yeah. But um, I've done something like this where I've taught where I'll take like four or five suggestions of like descriptions or a time period or a genre or something like that. And then I take those things and I put them all into one makeup. So it's going to be very oh similar God. to that. But what I'm going to do instead is sort of create this, this character and hopefully the many wigs that I have at home, one of them will fit this character, but uh, so that you can see like a complete, maybe not the outfit because I'm not going to change, but um, but at least like you can, from here up, you can kind of see this complete character sort of develop over, over the period of time. And it's awesome. I also encourage people, if you have stuff at home uh, that you want to follow along with, to please do so. So, you know, if you have a uh, glue stick to cover your eyebrows, some powder, some foundation, and then just like, eye makeup, blush, lipstick, whatever you happen to have, um, you know, you can follow along or you can just, um, you can just watch. And also I really encourage uh, questions during it. And Hannah, since I won't be able yeah. to see because I won't have my glasses on, yeah. Hannah will moderate uh, the, uh, the question asking for me. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a very open dialogue type of thing. And it's about, it's more about creating character, but, you know, bringing something out of yourself. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm so excited. And I love the idea of interactive character creation that like opens up 
whole other part of performance and art that I get really excited about. So awesome, Friday at 5 p.m., makeup tutorial and participate in the character creation, watch it unfold before you, which is just so cool. Um, yep. and I, I'm i gonna link as many things as I can possibly think of from this conversation um, on our Facebook, on this video. So, you know, if you heard about a workshop that sounds cool to you or a resource um, or a thought leader, um, please check out this video after we wrap up um, and I'll link as many things as I can think of. And if I forget anything, please feel free to comment um, and I will add to it. So. Joe Delude the second, you are unparalleled and incredible. Thank you so much for your courage today. Talking thank you for thank you for having the discussion with me. It was really it's really nice to be able to talk about these things now. And, yeah. and I think there's lots more talk that needs to be done about these. So so, so yeah. much, yeah, yeah, so much. As Trenda said, it's a long game. And it is a very long game. Not sure yeah. we'll see the end of it in our lifetimes, but maybe yeah, the kids who are growing up now maybe might sort of see the end of yeah. it by the time they're adults but yeah yeah awesome well thank yeah. you thank you so much enjoy the rest of your day thanks you too thank you see all you right soon. bye